The, uh, the issues are, is, is it crime to care, which is the, the title of this conference, and of course, the big question is, is Islam being criminalized? Well, let's look at our, our dear leader, uh, David Cameron, the uh, Prime Minister of the UK, uh, for those who don't know. Um, he gave a speech in August, and this is what he said. Britain is an open, tolerant, and free nation. But we cannot stand by and allow our openness to be confused with a tolerance of extremism or one that encourages different cultures to live separate lives and allows people to behave in ways that run completely counter to our values. Adhering to British values is not an option and is an, uh, or a choice. It is a duty for those who live in these islands. I've never seen anyone contradict himself so quickly uh, before. Um, I don't think anyone mentioned to him that you know, maybe the Scottish might disagree. You know, they live in the same <laughs> islands, they might not be subscribing to British values anymore. So apparently you can vote your way out of that, so that's fine. That's for long. Yeah. <laughs> um, now here's the thing, people, some, many Muslims, we get this intuitive feeling that there's a war against Islam, or Islam's being criminalized. But when we say this to people, people say, oh, it's a bit of a conspiracy theory, it's a bit, that's a bit strange for you to say this. It's like, no, of course they don't, they don't hate Islam. It's just, you know, it's the 21st century, we don't have these religious wars anymore. It's, uh, it's maybe just the scent, or maybe it's just oil resources. Maybe it's just the neoconservatives, you know, those, those uh, bad old neoconservatives. Or just the far right, maybe it's just them. You know, or maybe it's just some corrupt politicians, you know, who uh, are looking for maybe the interest of Zionists and it's where they coincide. And so this is why they're having all this crackdown on dissent. But no, unfortunately, um, it is uh, a war uh, against Islam, or at least um, uh, the original uh, form of Islam, the lobotomized form of Islam, oh, they have no problem with. If, they, if you could uh, secularize our religion, they will have absolutely no problem. If you could do what the Christians were inevitably forced to do, and what most religions around the world after colonialism were forced to do, they'll have no problem with, uh, with uh, Islam. As Lord Cromer, who was the uh, governor of Egypt, he said, a reformed Islam is Islam no more. So they have no problem, as just as long as you reform yourself. Now you might think to yourself, well, okay, but I mean, is that just maybe just again just conjecture, just speculation? I mean, surely, you know, I mean, who would actually want to declare war on a religion or in this day and age? Or, or surely it's it's silly. I mean, because they they seem to have no problem with mosques and they have no problem with you praying and they have no problem with you not eating pork. So what is the issue? Well, here it is, the basis of of the West, the creed of the West. You could say the Tawheed of Western civilization is individualism. It's their tawhid, the belief in, the, their, their, belief in their, their oneness is the belief in individualism, which is that there is nothing greater or more important for political consideration than the individual, than the individual person, being the only material concern and the only concern of, of that matters. Now, liberalism is just political individualism, as in you apply individualism as a philosophy into politics. So you rights, freedoms, all these, uh, this, this, this paraphernalia, these, these, these terms, um, are related to, when they use this, they, they refer to the individual being the absolute sovereign and the absolute primacy of all things. The, the measure of all things is, is, is man, and the measure, and the, the measure of, uh, of what is good and bad is man. Now, here's the problem with this. Islam says the opposite of this, that as uh, humans, well, actually, technically speaking, are we truly individuals? You never taught yourself your language. You, you, you depend on other people to create you, as in your parents, and so uh, you, know, you depend on society. We depend on each other for so many things, you know. You can't put a person in isolation and then they'll be totally happy because they want, they need to be, we're social creatures. We're not, you know, individuals as the theory goes, but this is, a, this is a philosophical critique of individualism. But fundamentally, Islam believes that there is something greater than man, and that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The true individual, indivisible, you know, self-sufficient, independent. We're not these things, as individuals would have us believe. Allah is these things. This is our tawhid, this is our individualism. It's the individualism of the worship of Al-Ahad, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, again, liberals wouldn't have any problem with this if, you if it was just your belief which you just kept inside your head. 
You know, they don't mind as long as it has no political consequences. I mean, you know, they're happy with Christians and Jews to believe in one God, just as long as that, you know, he doesn't have any, have any say in our lives. It's kind of like you can basically believe in any God you wish, just as long as he's silent. And that's the way they want. That's the way they want God. Unfortunately, Islam doesn't believe in a silent God. Islam believes that God guides and reveals his will. And it doesn't just talk about your relationship in terms of how you pray to God, but that all actions and activities is a worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, this is where fundamentally they're going to have a clash. And they're going, they have to have a clash because this is inimicable to their very belief, to their very creed is con contradictory to um, Islam. And consequently, they will clash on all the manifestations which they believe are contrary to their creed of individualism. So example, the Islamic dress. Haven't you ever heard they say, women wearing it, it's, it they're oppressing themselves? Or, you know, first they try to say they've been, they've been made to wear it. When it was demonstrated that women choose to wear, let's say, the, let's say burqa or niqab or someone, or the jibbab, then they say, well, then they have been brainwashed and they don't realize it, but they're oppressing themselves. Why? When they say this, what they mean is that she's an individual and she's, um, she's uh, in, in her error, chosen to relegate her individuality to God, to, uh, being subservient to God, and this is against our creed. That's what they mean when they say this. People really realize that how can someone, if they've chosen something, oppress themselves? But that's what they mean when they this is what they mean when they say this, that if you do something, if you relegate your desires to something greater than yourself, they view this as self-oppression. And they must liberate you from it, even if you don't like it, and even if you don't want it. And they will, and, and likewise, they have um, suppressed, or they will they find a very grievous any public manifestation of Islam beyond just it being a spiritual, uh, a spiritual faith, which, which is what they want it to be. For example, um, in gender segregation, they said, oh, segregation gender, oh, that's, uh, that's oppressing women and the individuality of the, of the women is being not respected as equal to the man. And then you say, but if, you, if you're having a lecture like this and women are on one side and men are on the other side and they both have equal distance to the speakers to listen, where's the actual, you know, uh, discrimination or, or where is the actual uh, saying that women are less than men? Where, where is this? And they can't find any argument except to say, no, but it's, you, you, if that was the case, you wouldn't have any segregation in the first place. Well, look, people, if people choose to sit in one side and people choose to sit on the other side, that's, isn't that their choice? Oh, but they can't do that because, again, they are sub making themselves subservient to, to uh, a greater power, which is against the creed. This is how they argue it. That's why I'm sitting here, conscious. Exactly. <laughs> And of course, the, but you see, the thing is that if they know that you're not, you don't believe in that creed, they don't have a problem with you doing the same action. For example, go to Eton. There's gender segregation in a private school. There are actually many private schools where you, it's just single sex schools. Where's the, where's the kerfuffle about this? What about the Olympics and sports? Why not say let men and women participate for the same sports? Why are you segregating them? Right? But they say, well, oh, that's different. Of course it's different because for them it's like we know they're not Muslim, so they're not doing it for the wrong reason. <laughs> That's their issue. It's the reason you're doing it for, not what you're doing. Because what you're, what, because of the reason you're doing it for, they view it as contrary to their creed. And that is why they have an issue. They don't mind you being a, 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 a Muslim who prays, but they want you to, to approach Islam as you're an individual, your choice is the most important thing, and if you choose, like your taste or flavor, to be a Muslim, like a hobby, that's fine, because you're still making yourself the sovereign, the choice, the decider. But if you say, I make myself subservient to a higher power, they have a problem with that. This is where they have a problem, especially if it's, if it's political. We see now that they've also, there's other manifestations they suppress. They have issues, for example, they suppress books which talk, which talk about you know, uh, uh, the, the holistic or political aspects of Islam. The thing is now that because they've been so used to getting rid of censorship, at this point in time, it's hard to persuade the British public as to why they should, they should you know, um, censor books or ban books. So they found other creative ways of doing the same thing. So basically, say kutub books, if you sell it in your bookshop, for example, you could be done, uh, they, have, they have used the, that as a fact to, to establish that you might have terrorist intent. Selling jihadist literature was used in a case against uh, a, a Muslim in the UK. Uh, we see in schools, in schools, uh, the recent uh, the recent Trojan horse hoax. 
they said they didn't find any anything extremism meant no incitement to violence or anything like this. But the problem they said was that you had this Muslim religiosity being brought into schools. That Muslim religious you know uh, uh, plays or activities were being brought into schools. And 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 school is a secular institution which shouldn't have you know religion dominating over it or so on. This is quite funny because if you read the British law, currently as it stands, that the default uh, statute law for all schools are that unless you get an exemption, all schools must have assemblies which are, or, or, or any kind of activity which is beyond 50% Christian in nature as an obligation, as a duty. You have to get an exemption from that. You have to say, no, no, we're Muslim, majority Muslim pupils, so it wouldn't, it wouldn't fit this school. We're majority Jewish pupils, majority Sikh pupils, it wouldn't fit this school. You have to get an exemption. And one of the Birmingham schools, uh, well, one of the problems with them was apparently that their exemption had run out. And so they, hadn't, they had to resort by law to having mostly Christian worship assemblies and so on. So this whole argument about it's a, it's a sec secularism is, is the place for, is, is where, you know, what school should be about. A secular, uh, neutral ground is rubbish because according to British law, it's actually Christianity which is, uh, which is the soon to be the default. And of course, one could argue that, well, look, we pay our taxes, so we deserve representation in anything that our taxes are used to pay for. So something that should accommodate us because we are citizens who pay taxes, we have to be deserve some representation. That the Americans had a whole revolution on the phrase no taxation without representation. Right? So why can't we claim this? If, you know, if, if what they say about their democracy is true, of course there is something greater than democracy for them and that is individualism and that is their, their criteria. So they don't like it because it was Islam and it was Muslims and the, what, the thing they don't want is the next generation of Muslims being as religious or more religious than the, than the, the last. They want one of their taxes is, is hopefully they're hoping that gradually um, you know like Christianity the next generations will become less and less religious and hopefully they can just wait out Islam, wait out Islam to, to die off in the UK um, to, to any significant you know, practice. Uh, we also see the whole food scandal, isn't it interesting? Everyone's happy to have uh, battery produced you know, hens and, and mass produced you know, uh, meat from, from slaughterhouses which are you know, industrial, uh, industrial kind of design just to maximize production, very nasty conditions for animals. Suddenly everyone became animal conscious when it came to halal meat in a mainstream restaurants. So why was that? Because it was in mainstream restaurants, mainstream chains. You know, like Pizza Express, they didn't want that. They didn't want to actually provide a, an environment conducive to Islam because they're trying to limit the manifestations of Islam lest it create an environment whereby, um, well, lest you know, Islam spread out, out of control in, in, in their view, the holistic form of Islam. They're very worried about this. They would like you to adopt maybe to be able to eat uh, non-halal meat and accept that and, you know, and accept uh, less manifestations of Islam because they are worried, they don't know how to control, how do they control this? Also we see them dictating to us our political beliefs. Government funded many organizations and groups like the Quilliam, uh, Quilliam uh, Foundation, the ironically named Quilliam Foundation, which again is, is a, the biggest mystery is why they chose Abdullah Quilliam, the guy who believed himself in the caliphate, the guy who himself was appointed by the caliph of, of, of the Ottomans, the guy who himself said there's a war against Islam in his khutbah in England. He declared that all these things are what Quilliam Foundation is meant to be, you know, to, to be countering against, countering the narrative that there's a war in something. They're, they're trying to say that's not true and no, the caliphate is, that's Islamism. Yet they named themselves under the guy who believed those exact same things. The guy even said that Muslims should be joining the Muslim armed forces to fight against the British during World War I. He was telling people to fight against the British, telling Muslims to join the Ottoman army to fight against the British. It's so like non Equilium Foundation, I, you know, a beggar's belief. It's like the KKK setting up some group called the Malcolm X Foundation, you know, for interracial harmony. Like, what? <laughs> All right, it's just strange. Of course, and of course, the key issue is Syria and Gaza. And there are a number of reasons why they are criminalizing uh, uh, um, your concern for Syria and Gaza. The problem is this. One of the greatest things that they worry about and fear is the concept of Ummah. It's an international concept. Right? The West historically uh, and from its ideology are very concerned and worried about the concept of Ummah. Do you know that the Jews were persecuted in Germany during, obviously, before World War II? One of the arguments used against them is because they, they had an international community. 
which, which was beyond nationalism. It was you know, they viewed it as greater than, than, than their nation, and this made him a threat to Germany. Sounds familiar? It's, well, well it, it would be because this is exactly European thinking or Western thinking uh, throughout history. The worry that you are above the nation, when for them, the nation is the, highest, is the highest concern. All individuals come together and they give sovereignty to the nation as the, the expression of the public will of all the, the uh, individual's uh, constituents. And so for them, the highest concept, the highest God, so to speak, is the nation. And if you don't, uh, don't render yourself subservient to the nation, which is kind of ironic because they said no individual should make themselves subservient to something higher than themselves, but then they contradict themselves on this, but that's a different issue. Uh, but if you do that, then they, honestly, honestly they, they, they think they can't trust you, they think you're a threat, and of course, uh, they can't control you. And as Muslims, seeing Muslims going, for them seeing Muslims going to Syria, viewing their brothers and sisters in Syria as being of equal concern, and actually, you know, and actually going there to help them, this worried and concerned, it's not the fact that they worry that people actually will come back and will commit acts of terrorism because they know their intelligence agencies have told them that there is little chance of that happening. And in the past, people have gone off to fight wars. Uh, even the famous, famous uh, English writers like Bertrand Russell and George Orwell went to the Spanish Civil War to fight against fascists. There was no problem with them going. No one, no one stopped them from, from, uh, from going. Libyans uh, left England to go to fight against Gaddafi when, after England had obviously well, were assured that they could control the, the outcome of that revolution, that it wouldn't be an Islamic state. Once they could do that, they had no problem with Libyans traveling to Libya or expats or sons of expats going to Libya and getting up weapons and fighting against Gaddafi. No problem at all. You don't hear any worry about they're going to come back and blow things up. No. No one talks about that. No one, no one said no one had any problem with that. They didn't have any problem with Muslims going to Afghanistan to fight against uh, the, the Soviets, but the exception being they hated the Soviets and feared the Soviets more than they, than they saw them at that time. Now Soviets are gone, now they can focus on us. They have no problem with, with people going, Zionists going to Israel, Zion, British nationals going to Israel and signing up to, to the IDF force to fight in Gaza and to fight and, and before to fight in Lebanon. They have no problem with these things, they don't, they don't have any, any worries. They might come back and become uh, radicalized and blow things. No, they don't have any concern because of the, for this. Sure. Now, why, why do they treat these differently? It's because, historically speaking, um, throughout the formation of the West, their philosophers have, back then, they were worried about many similar ideologies. For example, Catholicism, when it was political, uh, the Protestant countries had the same worries about Catholics. They were a danger. They were viewed as a danger to the, to the nation, had to be dealt with, must, must be contained, must not even be t tolerated in some cases. John Milton, the so-called father of free speech, uh, in his Arapagitica, said that you can't tolerate Catholics and that basically you should exterminate them once you give them the time to, you know, with, with you know, gentle persuasion to become, to, to leave their Catholicism or leave their belief or, or in the Pope. If they don't, then you exterminate them and you can't tolerate them, basically. Right, why? Because they said the Pope, the, the allegiance of each Catholic to the Pope constituted a leader that was, that was higher than, the, than, than Britain as a nation uh, uh, and higher than, than, than people as an individual and so they just couldn't trust the Catholics uh, that had an, an allegiance outside or beyond Britain. And so if you, they don't uh, change their ways and you should try to persuade them at first, then you can exterminate them and you cannot be tolerant to them. And, this was, uh, and similar things were said by John Locke, to, you know, Thomas Hobbes, uh, Jacques Rousseau, in, in, not talking about Catholics, and of course John Adams in, uh, in the United States. Now that was Catholics, now Catholicism died as a political force, now we are the new Catholics uh, in the world, and now they're doing exactly the same thing they historically did to the Catholics, to us. So this is not a conspiracy theory, this is basically them being consistent and just continuing an, a historical policy to uh, what they believe is a recurring situation, a repeated situation. So what I, what I say, brothers and sisters, is, and I'll, I'll, I'll end on this, I know that time is pressing on, there are, there's only two schools of thought amongst liberals today, only two schools of thought. There's one school of thought says that Muslims will never change and so they should not be tolerated, the goat wielders of this world, they're liberals, they're not far right or neoconservative. And, and of course, the other, there's other school of thought that says, no, give them time, they can be changed. And that's the only two schools of thought amongst liberals. 
Right, don't worry, give Muslims time, they will change their religion. Maj Nawaz happens to be on, on the more lenient side, ironically. Maj Nawaz is just a liberal. That's all he is. And I challenge every other liberal uh, Muslim who, says, who calls himself liberals, and they don't like him because they view him as giving him bad press. But I challenge him saying, tell me something about Maj Nawaz which is not liberal. Just one thing of what he's done or said which is not liberal, not from your ideology. Tell me. And they, they have nothing. They, they try to say some things which were actually not true. Like oh, he tried to ban organizations. No, he actually didn't. He tried, he said we should use other means to force them, to pressure them, to get rid of them. He didn't say ban them by law. All right, so t I, I made that challenge out and they can't, they couldn't provide any argument. So to conclude, I'll say this. They claim they believe in separating religion from politics. Yet their politicians tell us what our religious beliefs should be. They claim they believe in religious conscience, uh, um, yet when not in line with their foreign policy, they criminalize Muslims for following their conscience. They claim they believe in representing the beliefs of the people, yet they tell Muslims we have no right to have our religious beliefs or practices accommodated in institutions that we pay tax for. They pressure and restrict Islamic organizations in the name of an open society. Uh, they, they incite the persecution of Muslims in the name of tolerance. They censor the expression of Islam in the name of free speech. And they imprison Muslim political dissidents in the name of freedom. Let them display their hypocrisy, irony, and the true nature of their ideology to the world. But let them be in no doubt that our mouths shall not be silenced from testifying the Shahada and all that it means. And our minds will not be fooled by their empty values and vain falsehoods. Our hearts will not flinch from loving and obeying Allah, the only master of this world and the next. We will not submit to the perishable and disobey he that never perishes. In being slaves to God, Allah gives us freedom. But in the name of Western freedom, they would have forced us to become slaves. Time to liberate yourselves, brothers and sisters.